Oh, Jesus, you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. You did indeed bear the guilt of all of our sin on your shoulders as you went to a cross in our place. Oh, Jesus, I pray that during this time we would remember you and we would remember you according to your word. We would remember you well. So we beg for your grace to do that, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. At this point in our service, we're going to take some time to remember Jesus for exactly who he is. It's a time for Christians to remember Jesus and the work that he did in their place on the cross. And so today we're going to be looking at a passage that will show us Jesus' commitment to live a sinless life. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 together. The setting here in Matthew 4 is that Jesus has recently been baptized the Holy Spirit has descended upon Jesus, and the Holy Spirit has compelled Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting before his public ministry begins. And Matthew records for us a series of three temptations that will show us Jesus' commitment to live a sinless life. And we see the first of those three temptations in verse 3. Jesus was hungry from his fasting, and Satan approaches him and tempts him. And he says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Satan commands Jesus, he tempts Jesus to disobey the Holy Spirit and provide sustenance for himself when Jesus was in the process of fasting. So Jesus responds the way we always should respond when temptation approaches us. Jesus goes right to scripture. He goes to Deuteronomy 8 and he tells Satan, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is the story of Israel in the wilderness and God's provision for them. When bread was not available, God sustained Israel with something else of his choosing. That was manna. So Jesus was telling Satan, in my obedience to the Holy Spirit, I don't have access to the normal means of provision. I don't have access to bread, but I will wait for my sustenance from God in the way that he chooses to provide for me. The same God can sustain me through bread. He's able to sustain me through any other means of his choosing. You've tempted me to run after my own provision, but I refuse to do that. Instead, what I'm demonstrating to you is that I am the son of God. And as the son of God, I obediently wait for my father's provision for me. So that was his first temptation. The second temptation starts in verse 5, and Jesus is taken away to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. And Satan says to him again, if you are the son of God, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up. Satan is referring back to Psalm 91, where the psalmist is reminding himself of God's protection to the obedient Old Testament saint in all of their ways. And all of their ways here refers to all of the avenues of life and all the activities of life that God has provided and that God has prescribed. There's a perimeter or there's a boundary to the condition under which God has promised his protection. Satan's temptation is so deceitful because he claims God will protect in any activity, whether that activity is sinful or obedient. He tempts Jesus to throw himself into danger and then presume upon God to rescue him. So Jesus again takes Satan to scripture. He takes him back to Deuteronomy to chapter six this time. He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That is what is written. The context here in Deuteronomy six is that God has explained to Israel the terms and the conditions of their relationship with him. God says to Israel, if you are gonna be in relationship with me, you will love me. If you're gonna be in relationship with me, you will fear me. If you're gonna be in relationship with me, you will obey me, but you shall not put me to the test. Jesus says to Satan, you are tempting me to put my father to the test. And I refuse to do that. I'm proving to you that I'm the son of God because the son of God does not put his father to the test. Instead, I trust him to be faithful to me in everything that he has committed to be faithful in. So then Satan takes Jesus to show him all the kingdoms of the world. This is his third temptation. And he says to Jesus, after showing him all the kingdoms, 
All these things I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus knows that one day the Father will put all things in subjection under his feet. One day the Father will give him to the church his head over all things. He knows that. It's the Father who gives these things to Jesus. Jesus understands that clearly. But here Satan is saying, I will give these things to you if you will bow down and worship me. Again, Jesus takes Satan back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 again. And he says, it is written once again, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus is saying, I refuse to give my worship to anyone other than the Father. So Jesus shows us that he waits for his Father's provision. He shows us that he refuses to put his Father to the test, and he worships his Father, and he worships his Father only. So what does that mean for us this morning as we gather around the Lord's table? Well, what we see in these three temptations is that Jesus is showing us that his life is without sin. His life is without sin. With all of his craft and all of his cunning, Jesus was beyond the reach of Satan. Satan simply could not induce Jesus to sin. He couldn't do it. And that is crucial to the Christian today because God's design for the salvation of the sinner demands that an innocent substitute take the place of the guilty sinner. That's God's design. 2 Corinthians 5, end of the chapter, verse 21, God took him who knew no sin and made him sin on our behalf so that we would be the righteousness of God in him. The Christian's righteous standing is contingent upon Jesus' sinless character. And so Jesus himself took that sinless character and he put himself, he hung himself on a cross, allowed himself to be crucified on that cross, and there he bore in his own body the sin of all of those who had put their trust in him, all of those who had looked to him as their savior and their Lord, all of those who would recognize that he is the sinless substitute and there he absorbed the full weight of the Father's right, good, just response to all of that sin in his own body. He satisfied God's wrath against those who looked to him, and they were free, and they were forgiven. And the aspect of Jesus, that's what we want to remember about him this morning, that he was God's sinless substitute for us in God's system of justice. So believer, rejoice today. When the elements come to you, take them and hold them, and remember Jesus' commitment to be a sinless sacrifice so that he was qualified to serve as that sacrifice and that substitute on your behalf. When you've prepared your heart, take the elements on your own. If you're here today and you don't embrace Jesus that way, if you don't embrace Jesus as the sinless substitute, as the only one who's qualified to serve in your place in God's system of justice, you need to understand that God's testimony to you is that whatever your design is to save yourself, that design will fail you. God's design is that salvation comes to those who recognize that they need a sinless substitute, and that substitute is Jesus. We're so thankful that you've chosen to be with us this morning. It's our privilege to have you here with us. But when the elements come to you, simply decline those. This is a time for Christians to remember what Christ has done for them in giving his life for them. So men, come and serve us. When everybody's received, we'll take on our own together. Thank you.